Okay, uh, we might as well get started. We uh, only have a short while here. Uh, my name is Dr. Rodney Roots. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a legal advisor to the Fully Informed Jury Association in Montana. Actually, it's the largest and oldest organization solely dedicated to the education of jurors. And there are many other organizations, of course, that educate jurors, but FIJA, Fully Informed Jury Association, which is uh, over 20 years old now, is the largest organization dedicated solely to the education of jurors. And uh, it was founded by a number of people in Montana, actually libertarians, people who were actually affiliated with the Libertarian Party years ago. Larry Dodge was one, uh, Don Doig was another. And of course, there have been other uh, people who came in early on and started to fuel the fully informed jury movement. And the, uh, the title of my talk is Fully Informed Juries, the forgotten cure for tyranny. We forget how vital juries are. Uh, you know, I, I study, you know, I think all of us do. We study, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here at the Libertarian National Convention. We study the history of liberty. And the history of liberty is largely tied to one country, and that is England. Praise God, thank God for English history. England, and libertarianism are largely intertwined. Uh, traditionally, England has been freer than France, Germany, and other countries in Europe. And it's largely due to uh, events that I don't uh, want to get deeply into, the Protestant uh, movements, the, the growth of literacy, the English Civil War in the 1640s. But uh, it's wrapped up with trial by jury. And that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, my name is Dr. Roger Roots, by the way. I'm from Montana. I'm an attorney, uh, longtime libertarian activist, um, and I've uh, written a number of law review articles, uh, at least one on this topic, and on the topic of grand jury law as well. Thomas Jefferson, this is one of the most famous quotes of Thomas Jefferson about trial by jury. I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet devised by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. One of his most famous quotes. What's really sad is that in modern court practice, you're almost forbidden to inform the jury about the constitution. Did you know that? Hell yeah. It's, it's the saddest thing in the world. I told my mother, my mother's an intelligent person, and, and I told my mother, did you know that as a juror, the judge doesn't even really want you taking the Constitution into the de deliberation room with you. The judge wants to be the sole source of the law. And they won't actually say, I don't know of a case where a judge has actually stopped the jury from reading the Constitution. I don't know of a case. But most judges, especially the tyrannical judges, actually believe that the jurors are not supposed to read the Constitution. The judge thinks he had, he gets to tell the jurors what the Constitution says and what it means. You want me to save questions to the end? Or... Uh, yeah, let's have questions and answers at the end. I'm gonna try to uh, have a, uh, save enough time for questions and answers. Uh, you know, the framers of the Constitution considered trial by jury so important that they enshrined the right to trial by jury in no fewer than three provisions of the Constitution. It appears in Article 3, uh, which was, of course, uh, before the Bill of Rights. Trial by jury appears in Article 3 of the Constitution. Remember, the Constitution was ratified in 1789. The Bill of Rights came two years later in 1791. Even before the Bill of Rights, there is a trial by jury provision. Then there is a trial by jury provision in the Sixth Amendment. And then there's another one that says that, uh, the right to uh, trial by jury in civil cases shall be preserved. That's in the Seventh Amendment. By the way, if you count the grand jury clause of the Fifth Amendment, there are four provisions that, that mention a trial by jury, or at least juries. And there are actually uh, segments of the Constitution that are about jury power that you don't think of as jury trial provisions. And I'll give you an example, the double jeopardy clause. The double jeopardy clause, which says that no criminal defendant shall twice be put in jeopardy. If you really think about it, that is a trial by jury clause. So the, the, the idea of juries and the power of juries was fundamental 
to the framers of the Constitution and the Founding Fathers. Fundamental. Uh, if you look at the statements of the Founding Father about trial by jury, all of the principal Founding Fathers that we know of, uh, you know, the one, the, all the great founders of the, of the, of the United States of America, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Alexander Hamilton, all of them are on record in one, in one place or another, in letters, sometimes in, in what they wrote and what they debated on. All of them are on record saying that the purpose of trial by jury is to be a check on government. It's not supposed to be just a fact-finding device, okay? Trial by jury, fundamentally, by constitutional design, is to act as a check on government. A lot of people don't realize that the only Supreme Court justice ever impeached was impeached in part for telling a jury that they had to follow the judge's interpretation of the law. How many of you knew that? This is the only Supreme Court justice, Samuel Chase, who was impeached, the only Supreme Court justice in America ever impeached. He was impeached for a number of reasons, but among that list of reasons, was that he had instructed a jury in, in one of the trials uh, arising from the, the infamous uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. He was a Federalist judge, and he uh, tried to tell the jury that they had to follow his instructions on what the law meant. He was impeached for this. And by the way, this is what modern judges do every single week in modern America. And Samuel Chase was impeached for it. By the way, he was not removed from office. The House voted to impeach him. He went up to the Senate. They narrowly voted to allow him to continue on the Supreme Court. Very interesting story. The very first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, John Jay, very first Chief Justice, and he is one of the primo founders. When I talk about framers, framers of the Constitution, John Jay is right up there. He was one of the authors of the Federalist Papers if, if anyone knows what the original intent of the Constitution was, it has to be John Jay, first Chief Justice. And the only time that we know of in which a jury was instructed by the Supreme Court, the only time that we know of and that we have their actual instructions, here's what's interesting. You know, the Supreme Court is not a trial court, obviously. It is an appellate court. So we don't even think of there being juries in front of the Supreme Court of the United States. However, way back, there was a very limited jurisdiction. And when New Jersey sued, you know, when, when a, one state sued another, there was a very smidgen of jurisdiction for a trial to exist before the, the United States Supreme Court, okay? And so there were a few trials, as far I believe legal historians say that there were three trials in the Supreme Court of the United States. Most lawyers have no knowledge of this, but there have actually been trials before the Supreme Court. And two of those, we don't have their jury instructions. But in, in one case, we have their jury instructions. John Jay gave this instruction to a jury. He said, in, in the case of Georgia versus Brailsford, 1794, quote, he was talking to the jury. This is the only known jury instruction that we know was approved by the Founding Fathers because he was one of them. And he was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. These are the only known instructions that we know of where they, the Supreme Court was instructing a jury about its, uh, its rights. Quote, it is presumed that juries are the best judges of fact. It is on the other hand presumed that the court are the best judges of the law. But still both objects are lawfully within your power of decision. Just think about this. Most jurors want to hear the judge tell them what the law is. They do. They want to have the judge tell them what the law is. The jurors in a, in a murder case want to know what is the law of murder? What is the law of first degree murder? What is the law of second degree murder? Third, you know, manslaughter, etc. John Jay said, yeah, the, the judge tells what, you know, judges are learned in the law. They tell the jurors what the law is. But both this is the Supreme Court of the United States. Both objects, the law and the facts, are lawfully within your power of decision. That means jurors get to decide the law, and if they don't agree with the law, they 
or, or the law is given to them by the judge, they can overrule the judge, at least with regard to their verdict in a criminal case. Today's court practice, of course, suppresses the constitutional purposes of trial by jury. And it does, the, it does this in a number of ways. Governments hate trial by jury. They hate it. Judges really, although they're very nice and sweet to the jurors in the courtroom, anyone who really watches a lot of jury trials and watches the judges, how they really think, anyone can tell that, in fact, most judges almost consider it an insult that common people are allowed to disagree with them on what the Constitution and the law means. So government and tyrants worldwide have always sought to limit trial by jury, and they do that by must convict jury instructions. If you've ever been in a, especially in most jurisdictions, especially in federal court, at the end of the trial, the judge will falsely tell the jury if you find that the government proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. And that is a lie. It's not true. By constitutional design, the jury always has had the right for over 300 years to find anyone not guilty, no matter how overwhelming is the evidence. Okay, so there must convict jury instructions all the time in most criminal jurisdictions in this country. Denial of the right to reference the law, including the Constitution. How many of you know that if you're on trial, your lawyer, if he stands up at a closing argument and he starts talking about, in a gun case, just for example, in a gun case, you're on trial for possession of a gun under the wrong circumstances or whatever. Uh, if, if your lawyer says to the jury, hey, there's a Second Amendment, you know, the Constitution that says you have the right to bear arms, what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you what will happen because it happens all the time. The prosecution will be livid and will say, objection, your honor. He's telling the jury what the law is. And only the court, you the judge, your honor, get to tell the jury what the law is. And the judge will sustain the objection. So your lawyer, or even you sometimes, will be lectured by the judge. The judge will tell you, no, you're not supposed to tell the jury about the Second Amendment. Because the judge will already rule in the back channel in, in pretrial proceedings or whatever that a particular statute is constitutional even in spite of the Second Amendment. Happens all the time. Oath warnings. This is something that is very difficult to deal with because here's what happens. Jurors get sworn in. They say, will you please raise your right hand? They all swear an oath. Do you swear that you will give our proper verdict and, and be a proper jury. And it, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It varies from state to state. Some of the oaths differ from county to county. All right? And some of them are long-winded and they have Latin phraseology in it. Um, and then at the end of the trial, sometimes these trials go a week long, two weeks. Then at the end of the trial, the judge will remind the jurors in an intimidating way. You will be violating your oaths as jurors if you dare to disagree with me on what the law is. And of course, most jurors don't know that they can't be punished. It's, it's, it's a bluff. It really is. Most jurors don't know that the judge is bluffing. They can't be punished. And so they're reminded of their oaths that they took. And they don't even remember the oaths. And again, many of these oaths are so convoluted in the way they're written that that you can interpret these oaths in about a dozen different ways. And of course, jurors are kept in the dark regarding sentences of defendants if they decide to convict. Uh, it happens all the time that jurors think that, well, we'll, let's say it's a 15 count federal indictment, uh, drug charges, gun charges. It, it happens all the time that the uh, uh, jurors will think that they're slapping the defendant on the wrist. They will find the defendant not guilty of everything except for one minor count, what, what they think is a minor count. But they are in the dark about sentencing. So they think they're slapping the guy on the wrist when he might get six months. And then later on, at, at a sentencing hearing, a month later, they find that the guy got 40 years in federal prison. It happened. It happened in the Branch Davidian case in Waco. The jurors thought they were finding the defendants not guilty of all these ridiculous charges, conspiracy to murder federal agents, conspiracy to terrorize federal agents. They said not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. 
but I think they decided to convict them of what they thought was a minor charge. I forget what that charge was. Later on, the judge gave the defendants as much as 40 years in federal prison. The jurors thought they were going to get about six months. Legal tricks. There are a variety of legal tricks that have been sort of developed by the lawyers and the judges. They establish a bright line separating supposed issues of law and issues of fact, as if those issues are separable. Um, there are so many ways that a judge will hold that a, some, that a, that a certain de, uh, decision is an issue of law for the judge to decide. Then they move this allegedly bright line in the direction of judicial decision. I'll give you an example. The question of whether there was probable cause to make an arrest, which is a, a frequently recurring issue in the law. Was there probable cause for that cop to make that arrest? I can show you the case law from the 1800s that that was a question for the jury. The jury decided whether there was probable cause. But over the years, judges have gradually ruled more and more in most courts, most jurisdictions, that the question of whether there was probable cause is a legal question for the judge. In some cases, courts will utterly remove an issue of fact completely from the jury's hand. I'm going to give you an example. Federal gun charges sometimes have a uh, uh, provision in the statute that says, you know, some, such and such uh, individual convicted felon, uh, such and such, shall be not, you know, disabled from possessing firearms that have traveled in interstate commerce, unquote. It's gone up to the Supreme Court in a couple of cases, and the Supreme Court rules, the, t the phrase travel in interstate commerce means that it was manufactured in a state and old, cross the state line at any time in its history, okay? If you're on a jury in such a gun case, don't you have the right to ask, well, did, the, did it really travel in interstate commerce? And what does that really mean? Traveling in interstate commerce could mean to many people, well, it had to have been sold over a state line, not just travel, not just, not just went over a state line at some time in its history. And of course, the, the point is a jury, that's a question of fact, is it not? I mean, a fundamental, quintessential question of fact. And yet, in modern federal courtrooms, the judges take that decision from the jury. And they say, no, that's a question of law, and we rely on a couple of Supreme Court decisions, and we rule that by as a matter of law, the firearm uh, traveled in interstate commerce. And they will take it from the jury, even though it is clearly an issue of fact. Death qualified juries is another horrible thing that has developed in the law in the last 50 years. Uh, sometimes at, at voir dire, the period where the jurors are asked before trial about themselves, they're asked, many times they're asked to answer some questions about themselves. And of course, some Americans disagree with the death penalty. It happens and it has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. They have approved of a, of a vile and despicable process where jurors are asked, hey, uh, I know that you disagree with the death penalty, but could you convict, uh, you know, could, could you, uh, you know, find this individual guilty knowing that he'll get the death penalty? Guess what happens to the jurors that say, no, I won't. I don't approve of the death penalty. Guess what happens to them? <laughs> they don't make it on the jury. All right? So they have death-qualified juries. And by the way, there have been studies. Studies show that people who are anti-death penalty also tend to be liberal on a number of other criminal procedure issues and tend to be a little bit more pro-defendant in a variety of ways. So that process, the death-qualified jury process, removes all the liberal pro-defendant uh, jurors from the jury panel. There's another thing called special verdict forms. You know, a general verdict, when you think about it, when a jury has the power to just say guilty or not guilty, that's known as a general verdict. They don't have to explain themselves to the judge or anybody else. They don't have to provide any factual conclusions or determinations. They can just say guilty or not guilty. And when you think, when you think about that, that is a great power because it means that all the powers of the prosecution who thinks that they're wrong 
uh, don't have the ability to cross-examine them or to ask them, or how did you arrive at not guilty? My God. You know. And so over time, especially in civil cases, you will see special verdict forms. You don't see them too much, thank goodness, in criminal uh, cases. But in, you'll see it a lot in civil cases, car, car crash cases, where the jurors will be asked to fill out information on the verdict form, not just libel or not libel or guilty or not guilty. They are asked to fill out specific information. How much damage occurred in, in this car crash? Or what percentage, uh, uh, what percentage of the um, liability should rest on the brake manufacturer? What percentage should rest on the shoulders of the driver? Those kinds of questions are common in civil cases. They shouldn't exist at all in criminal cases. But it has crept into the criminal law as well, that occasionally criminal juries now are asked to fill out specific statements. Uh, this actually is the special verdict form from a sort of famous case involving a congressman, William Jefferson. Uh, how much money, if, you know, asking the jury to fill in how much money do you think this guy allegedly you know, mishandled or misappropriated or whatever. Uh, so special verdict forms are another legal trick that courts and prosecutors use to stifle the jury's power. Of course, another major weapon in the government's arsenal is the, uh, do they have the power to make them go up those forms? Uh, the question was, do they have to do the judges have the power to make them fill out the forms? I'll tell you, the answer is, it depends on the case. Um, it can get complicated and the lawyers can disagree. I was actually in a case in the U.S. Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis. We challenged a special verdict form, took it up to the Eighth Circuit, and they, they upheld it, you know. Um, we said it was a violation of the jurors' prerogative. Jurors don't, shouldn't have to fill out all these, uh, you know, the jurors have the power to say guilty, not guilty, we argued, and we lost. So there's this, this phenomenon is creeping into the law. Where the judges, um, what, he asked what would happen if a juror said I'm not doing it. Good question. I would say by and large that would be um, um, it would be hard to convict if they didn't fill out the form, wouldn't it be? So if the jurors refused to fill out the form, I would say almost as a matter of law that that would be a, a mistrial or a, uh, I would say an acquittal. It's at least a mistrial. So it, it stands that there can, there's nothing they can do to the juror. No, no. no juror can ever be punished. See, this is part of the bluff. Yeah. No juror can ever be punished for his verdict. And it's part of the bluff that courts use. By the way, that goes back 300 years to actually to a very famous case involving William Penn yeah. in England. Before he came to what is now the United States in the 1600s, in the year 1670, William Penn was on trial in England. Uh, for preaching a, uh, a Puritan, I'm sorry, a Quaker. He was a Quaker in England, which was a banned religion. And Penn preached a Quaker sermon, was put on trial. Uh, the jurors refused to convict. They kept coming back. The judges got mad at him. At that time, there would be more than one judge presiding in England. And they'd send them back. And, and finally, after about the third time, the jury, the jury came back saying, well, we, we find him guilty of preaching in the street but the charge was preaching in the street illegally or something like that. And so the judge says, so, oh, does that mean they're convicted? They're guilty? And the jurors finally said, no, just, we, they preached in the street, but we, we, we're, not, we're gonna find them not guilty. They locked up the jury <laughs> in England. Very famous case, it's called Bushell's case. Very famous common law precedent that is still good law. It has never been overturned. Uh, on a habeas corpus petition, another judge said, no, these jur jurors can never be punished for their verdict and released them. That is still good law. No juror can ever be punished for his verdict. Anyway, another major weapon in the government's arsenal is the suppression of jury information outside the courthouse. And this is a very, to me, this is one of the, the most despicable phenomenon, phenomena that is currently happen is they will try to even uh, the judges will try to get involved even in what is going on outside the courthouse. Uh, you will see in, in particular places that 
some of our uh, fully informed jury association literature. People will just be outside the courthouse handing literature to potential jurors or just the general public saying, well, here, did you know that uh, the juries have the absolute power to acquit? You know, just handing out information which is acknowledged by all sources to be true. And yet they will be sometimes be accused of jury tampering. This is happening. And by the way, we have a gentleman here in the room that this has happened to. We're gonna, we're gonna introduce him uh, shortly. Uh, increasingly, judges and prosecutors will say that the mere act of handing outside the courthouse, handing a piece of literature to people outside the courthouse that just says, you know, did you know that you have the absolute, you can vote your conscience? Uh, prosecutors hate this, and they are uh, accusing people of jury tampering for this. Keep in mind, what is the crime of jury tampering? It's an ancient crime, and I, I don't think anybody really disagrees with the crime of jury tampering. Jury tampering is when you buy up, when you go to a juror and you intimidate or threaten or, or try to scare the jury or, or buy off the jury. That's jury tampering. Nobody has a problem with it. But handing literature that informs the juror about the great constitutional history of trial by jury, how could that possibly be a crime? Uh, in Denver last year, several arrests for jury tampering just for handing out jury information literature on the steps of the courthouse. By the way, uh, those have been thrown out. There's a great civil rights lawyer who got involved. Uh, and is, is, has actually achieved a federal injunction, an injunction to stop the cops from arresting anyone for leafleteering and handing out pam pamphlets in front of the Denver City Courthouse there. That case is ongoing. The government hates that. They're appealing. Some of this stuff is still in court. It goes up, up and down for years. Uh, these two gentlemen, uh, seven counts of jury tampering. These two gentlemen. Uh, Mark Brandt and Martin Inicelli, accused of jury tampering in Denver uh, just last year for handing out jury uh, information. And this is Eric Brandt, sort of, a, he's an occupied Denver uh, uh, activist. I wouldn't call him a libertarian, but he's sort of an occupied Denver kind of guy. You see him running, he has a, a flag that says uh, F-U-C-K cops and uh, megaphone. Here's my favorite. Picture is the cop, uh, the fat cop trying to chase him down. <laughs> anyway, sort of an interesting character in Denver. Uh, this guy here named Keith Wood, Macosta County, Michigan. Actually, he's a pastor. And uh, he went out to his local courthouse and started handing out jury information, uh, you know, about the great grand history of trial by jury. He was arrested. Felony counts of jury tampering. By the way, recently, again, there's action in that case. That case is still going on, but the prosecution has dropped to misdemeanors. And frequently, they, the prosecution doesn't like to take these guys up on felony charges because why? They get a, a jury, and they don't actually want to show the jury. This would be evidence in the case. <laughs> um, and so they'll drop it down to a misdemeanor. They want these guys to plead guilty to petty little things. Sometimes they try to get them into petty trials that are bench trials by judges instead of jurors. This is Julian Heitland. You didn't mention there that how much the bond was. Oh, that's right. What was the bond? It was hundreds of... $150,000. Yeah, unbelievable. $150,000. And he had to pay that with his own credit card. He had to come he, up with 10%. Somebody gave him that credit card a week ahead of time. He said, I'll never use this thing. <laughs> yeah. And again, some of these cases are going on, but the thing is, our side generally wins at the lowest level. This is, generally speaking, uh, this is another activist named Julian Heitland. Uh, Julian Heitland has been arrested right here in Orange County, Florida. This is sort of ground zero, right here in Orange County, Florida. Uh, he's an old guy, he's actually a, a retired chemistry professor from, I believe, Penn State. And uh, he goes around, he's a libertarian activist, and he, goes around with a sign that says jury info and potential jurors walk up to him and he hands them information. He's been arrested a number of times and here's what he does. When, he, when they confront him, he falls to, the, falls to the sidewalk and then they have to come and 
you know, usually they don't bother him, but say he's been arrested. Actually, in the U.S. District of New York, he was arrested, which is maybe the major, you could say that, that's New York City, downtown Manhattan. He won. He actually defeated uh, the prosecution in a big case. Uh, the the uh, U.S. Uh, trial court justice named Kimba Wood uh, said that, you know, it's a First Amendment right. So he was acquitted totally. All the charges were dismissed up there. He has charges elsewhere, and I believe he even has current charges right here in Orange County, Florida. If you, here's our friend right here, who is our local Orange County, Florida celebrity, Mark Schmitter, right here in the room. Mark Schmitter has been arrested how many times? Well, uh, can I count just two? Okay. Yeah for, for uh, doing the exact same thing, going down to the uh, county courthouse right here in Orlando, Florida, right here, handing out FIJA flyers, jury uh, information flyers, and they have arrested him for, actually it's a little bit of an odd case because he was accused of contempt of court, correct? Because the judge, this is in that big Casey Anthony case, right? The Casey Anthony case involving this sort of uh, a good looking girl who had a baby that it that disappeared. disappeared. She was on trial for murder. Our friend Mark Schmitter here was out informing the jurors of their rights and they arrest uh, uh, the judge had issued a proclamation that was posted around saying no one shall issue any uh, pamphlets around the courthouse. And so Mark, I believe, was not accused of jury tampering, it was contempt of court, right? Uh, uh, he tied them in together, but He said it would be considered uh, jury tampering, but it was indirect criminal contempt of court. Yeah, and uh, again, I mean, I, I, I think the ACLU got in the case, and then did they drop it, or what yeah, happened uh, there? They got into the case in the very beginning when he issued the administrative order, and then the 5th District Court of Appeals ruled in Belton's uh, judge judge's uh, favor on that one. But then, then after, um, I can't remember now. So anyhow, that made any difference. I, I defied it and ended up in the cage. <laughs> and, and I believe Mark served how many days? Um, I was sentenced to 151 days for not being in the free speech zone. <laughs> and, uh, and 146 days for the flyer. Fifth District Court of Appeals picked out the free speech zone. So um, uh, I was hit 146 days. Then you get off for good behavior, so I ended up doing 97 total. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, let's give the top of the applause for my story. Um, this is Frank Turney, who's one of the original Fiji activists in Alaska, also a libertarian activist in Alaska. Uh, he was convicted of jury tampering up there. Uh, the facts were a little bit strange because he was actually going inside the courthouse. He wasn't just outside, and he was going right up to the jurors. And his friend was one of the people on trial, so he had a. It was very clear that he had. He, he was seeking a specific verdict. You know, you're pretty safe. I mean, the First Amendment generally protects you. You know, unless again they can get you on, in different ways. But when it's clear that you're a friend or a relative of the defendant and you're wanting the jury to come out with an actual verdict, you get a little, you're get you skating on a little bit of thinner ground. And by the way, for the record, I would argue you have a First Amendment right even to do that, in my opinion. But again, I'm in the minority. Courts disagree with me, okay? Um, and it was upheld. Frank Turney's was upheld. His conviction was upheld by the U.S. Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. So the facts, some of these cases can really turn on the facts. Like I said, Mark Schmitter's case had this strange thing where the judge had issued a proclamation. Then he was accused of contempt of court. Some, sometimes it involves, you can really get into what were the facts. But generally speaking, I would say the First Amendment protects you when it's very clear you're just handing it to everyone. Not, you're not targeting just jurors. Uh, you're not trying to get an actual specific acquittal or specific verdict. Um, an interesting fact about this, I mean, I'm in, I'm, this is an area of law that I'm into, but I'm rare. There aren't many lawyers who are into this. Usually, Fiji wins at the lowest levels, which means that we don't get good case law. You know, case law happens on appeal. You have to lose first and go up. 
the Supreme Court hasn't really issued a case on this stuff in years. And so it's ripe for, you know, some legal test cases and challenges. The problem, actually it's not a problem, I was about to say the problem is we tend to win at the lowest levels and then it doesn't go up on appeal. And so there isn't a lot of case law on this, which allows, it's good and bad, it's good and bad. It allows the system to say, hey, it's illegal. And they point to cases at the trial level, it's illegal, you can't hand this out. And of course, there is not, not good case law at the appellate court level and at the Supreme Court levels. So this is an area that is ripe. I would invite any of you who are into uh, studying law or getting involved in activism of any kind. The future, uh, there are gonna be battles in the future on this. This is just heating up. I made an, argue at, uh, an argument at a, a conference in Denver. The, the, the prosecution bar is trying to invent a First Amendment exception. When you think about this, no one was arrested for handing out literature 100 years ago about this. The prosecution bar in this country is trying to invent a new First Amendment exception. Uh, and we've got to stop them. And I thank you very much for this opportunity, and I would love any questions and answers. Uh, uh, any questions from the audience? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm long been interested in that here, Carl. I'm one of the members of Mark Rota. And one of the things I think is unique about jury trial rights is, like in Mark Rota's guarantee, uh, you have the guarantee rights of for a jury trial. But as it existed in 1880 when the state constitution was passed, and I actually went in and did my little research, and I won the right to a jury trial for a violation of a city ordinance that had a $20 fine mm -hmm. and changed the whole system. <laughs> no, it's a good interesting article for this report. Interesting. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, the Seventh Amendment has a line in it that says, trial by jury in civil cases shall be preserved. The word preserved is in there for all cases that amounting to more than $20. Okay, the courts over the last 200 years have, have used that word preserved. They've twisted it and said, well, that just means that you get a jury trial. If you would have got a, a jury trial in the same kind of case back in 1791, by the way, for those of you who, <laughs> I don't want to get deep into this, but, let, but yesterday on the floor of the Libertarian Convention down below, where I was a delegate, a, a, plank, a platform plank came up with that term preserved, the right shall be preserved. And I thought about the Seventh Amendment and the way the judges have manipulated and distorted that word. But yeah, the gentleman from North Dakota is correct. The judges, when you go, I mean, $20 isn't much nowadays, and so, the, the courts will, it depends on the jurisdiction, it varies a lot from state to state, but when you try to get a jury trial in your traffic ticket case or your parking ticket case, but remember those are civil, civil, were generally civil infractions involving more than 20 bucks, you think you, according to the plain text of the Seventh, seventh Amendment, you have a right to jury trial, and yet courts in most many jurisdictions will manipulate it and say, no, you don't have a right. Uh, because it's, it, it, it has to do with, in 1791, there were different kinds of courts. There were chancery courts, there were equity courts, there were common law courts, and juries were only in the common law courts. And so, if the modern judges say, hey, that's a chancellery kind of a case, and you wouldn't have had a jury trial back in 1791, a, a, a religious or some kind of other uh, legal issue. And so they've used that word, preserved, to deny the right to jury trial in a lot of civil cases. Now, this might be a little bit off the track, but what's your position on absolute immunity for judges and prosecutors? Um, well, I was just talking to Mark about this. Uh, judges over time, and by the way, this is not the way it was 200 years ago, but today, judges almost are absolutely immune uh, from lawsuit for anything they do as a judge. You can still sue them for a car wreck outside, or you know, but by and large, anything they do as a judge, including spitting in your face in the courtroom, beating you up, I'm pretty sure they can throw a punch at you in the courtroom, and all that will happen to them, you can't sue them because they have absolute immunity, they will be, I'm pretty sure that in that kind of a case they would be removed as a judge. They might even face some bar, you know, bar, bar, bar issues with the, with the legal profession, but you cannot sue them for anything they do as a judge. Judge 
sued for sexual harassment, of course, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm actually a little bit surprised even at that. I, I mean, I've seen cases where judges will grab people by the collar outside the hallways and things, and the guy sues, and they will dismiss the case, saying, oh, judges are absolutely immune. Is there, is there a criminal material in someone who is an attorney that sees what he's talking about? Is there a criminal material in Let me just say, I think it's something that people should start demanding. Yeah, her point was that is there a movement in the law to change this? It's a small movement if there is one. Let me just tell you, it's. Uh, and by the way, the Supreme Court has ruled even sovereign immunity. You know, cops have qualified immunity. Cops themselves are difficult to sue because they have qualified immunity. But the immunity for judges is even higher than that. It's virtually absolute. Uh, well, he mentioned the common law grand jury away. Well, listen, I mean, you, there are me mechanisms that you can try. And I, I think all libertarian activists would want you to try those. As to what the result will be, you know, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle in many, in many ways. And I can tell you, I, I'm familiar with cases like the Montana Freeman case 20 years ago, where they started their own common law grand jury and things. What happened to them? Well, they get indicted for a conspiracy to intimidate federal officials and things. Um, what was the color of the law? Um, well, the point is, you, you can try to start a common law grand jury and investigate and stop this stuff. The powers that be are very powerful. So, just be, be very cautious. I'll go to this guy. You said uh, jurors can be punished for work. What about uh, if they lie, say, during jury selection? They uh, that, and they say, no, I'm not opposed to that penalty, but they are. Uh, that kind of thing has happened in a number of cases. There was a case in Colorado maybe 20 years ago, the Laura Creho case. Uh, Laura Creho was a juror. And she came, well, she, they, they accused her later on. Well, she ended up being a very powerful, thoughtful, and activist juror. She really led the jury to acquit a drug defendant. And that made the prosecution very angry, and they started looking at this juror. Well, what kind of juror is this, this Laura Creho? And sure enough, they dug into her background, and she had been arrested on a drug charge herself. I believe it had been thrown out or something like that. She did have a history of, of him pot uh, activism, she was a marijuana legalization activist, and they charged her criminally with lying, saying that she should have told the court when she came into to, uh, the jury uh, voir dire proceedings, that she had some duty to tell the court about all this. And uh, that case went up and down uh, in the Colorado courts. It's funny, I, I had a great conversation with a great lawyer out there named Paul Grant, who was one of the main lawyers for Laura Creho. Ultimately, she prevailed. Everything was dismissed or it was sort of set aside or the conviction was vacated uh, with uh, some kind of thing where maybe the prosecution could have brought it back, but they didn't. So and ultimately, she prevailed. But yeah, absolutely. If you're going to be, if you're going to be the person that leads the jury to, uh, uh, you know, uh, an acquittal that the government doesn't like, better believe it, they're going to look into you and they're going to look into it. Anything they can to try to target you. Did, did she lie to him or just the error of the no, That's just it. She had not lied. She had not lied. But they said, well, there were there was a question of, of do any of you have any issues that you you know, it was that kind of a bland question. And they said in response to that kind of a question that she had some duty uh, to say, Well, I, I you know, I I've been uh, accused of a of marijuana thing or something. And ultimately, again, she prevailed, but it took a lot of activism and a lot of good lawyering uh, to make that happen. How, how do they know what the, that she led the charge? Uh, I believe they went and questioned some of the other jurors. I believe they did. So what's discussed in the juror room? It... Uh, well, it's another, that's another issue is, uh, you know, Fija, our position is that the juror should never be made to ever say what happened, what their deliberations were based on. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, keep in mind they can voluntarily say such things, and, you know, some jurors do. So, you know, they can, it, it's, it's possible to, to get information from the jurors about what happened there, um, but it, they certainly can't be compelled. Any other questions? Yeah, going back a little bit, uh, you mentioned, I think it's Corpus and Daniel in there, and uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if you've got a poor person who's sitting in jail, uh, he, uh, he needs to get up illegally, he needs to get the word out, he wants to get out of his Corpus, but he, he doesn't have any money for a lawyer, no one knows he's in jail, uh, so who has the right to bring the court, who has the right to bring the Davis Corpus back? Well, actually, there is an ancient uh, there is an ancient provision in common law going back hundreds of years to ancient England called the Next of Friend petition, a Next of Friend petition for habeas corpus. It, 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 it would happen in England where they would take some pamphleteer and they would accuse him of sedition or something, and they put him in the Tower of London. And his friends, keep in mind, he had no pen, no paper, no paper, no pencil. His friends would go to the Tower of London or go to the courthouse, and they was known as the Next of Friend Petition, and they could fill out a habeas corpus petition for his release in his behalf, even though he was up there in the Tower of London. So there is a provision, and it still exists, known as the Next of Friend Habeas Corpus Petition. But by and large, I can just tell you, in reality, what really happens, in, at least in federal courts, when you go to try to help somebody else out, and you go and type up documents, papers, pleadings, they're gonna, they'll do everything they can to ignore those. Oh yeah. That's just the reality, go ahead. Uh, could I address them, just give them some points? Sure, okay. I would love to have Mark, uh, again, this is a, let's give a good hand, let's give a big hand to Mark Smith. Here's what I hear, here's what I hear, here's what I hear. It's on camera here. Okay. Uh, yes indeed, howdy ladies and germs. Uh, anyhow, uh, I've been doing this since uh, 2010, and if I could ever think of something with the least amount of time that has the biggest impact for your time, there's really nothing any better than this. Because I still hand these out in Seminole County, I can't do it in Orange County, Judge Bell and Perry will put me back in the cage. <laughs> So, uh, but, but for four years, I hand them out, uh, probably, uh, I do it every Monday, because that's when the jurors come in. So the doors open up at like 7.30 or 8, so I'm there at about 7.25. Takes me a half hour to drive there. These, these cost me about a nickel each. I go with 200 or 250 of them, and uh, just, just get there, I have a shirt on from Fiji that says no victim, no crime. And usually the, the uh, uh, summoned jurors, they're not jurors yet, are lined up out in front. So I just go get there and just hand one to another and there's only about 1% of them won't take it. But uh, uh, they, they do give me a little grief every once in a while, but now I've been doing it so long, I'm just friends with all, all the uh, sheriffs there, you know, like, What'd you do last weekend? Oh, I went to target shooting. What'd you do? I don't know, I went down the river, you know, so everything's fine there. But um, the rule is, if you're not getting flack, you're not over target. That's the key. That's a good one. That's, that's true. true. Good one. Yeah. Okay, so um, get the flyers. You just hand them, and if they want to talk to you about it, yeah, that's fine. But um, you might want to make sure you hand them to everybody. Don't get cheap and say, I'll save a nickel because I know this guy is going to use it. Because that's one of the grounds. Now, the next thing is, since what you're doing does not violate the Constitution, it doesn't violate state, state statute nor a city ordinance, for the judge to stop you, he has to issue an administrative order from the bench. And only he can enforce it. But that administrative order, since you aren't breaking any kind of law anywhere, it, it has to be uh, subjective and uh, selectively enforced, which is also unconstitutional. So they aren't going to arrest you. They're going to come down because they don't want you in their court. Because if you would get arrested for some reason and you defend yourself, as soon as you tell them that you're going to defend yourself and you're going to educate the jury about jury nullification, they aren't going to want you anywhere around. 
uh -uh. they don't really want to arrest here because it would just open up a can of, uh, oh man, it'd be awful on them. So um, they're going to hand you an administrative order for first and you have your option to leave or not. And I did. I chickened out and I left. And then Julian Heitland came down and made me get more involved, so that wasn't too hard. <laughs> yeah, I know, an 80-year-old man told me to go. Okay, so um, just go ahead and out. He'll give you an administrative order and then just quit doing it if you want to go to the next courthouse. But uh, believe me, this, this can change somebody's life. Uh, all that stuff about writing letters to your congressman and calling them up and sending emails and stuff, yeah, it probably works. But I didn't know if it is, but I know this works because they're scared of it. Okay, question, sure. Where's a good place to get those pamphlets? Oh, you, you get them right from FIJA, and they got a PDF file. You bring them up to uh, Office Depot, and they'll print them up. And, and I get my own printer. FIJA.org. Yeah. Go to FIJA.org. F-I-J-A.org. And, and this is just on cheap paper. You know, I have an uh, uh, industrial type printer in my office, and I have a folding machine, so. Uh, Mark, two things. Um, Perry has retired, so I don't see the problem anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, the order is because it carries through. Is it indefinitely order? Or yeah, it goes on forever. Okay. And then secondly, um, with attorneys who do this, there's an issue concerning uh, ethics violations. Oh, I wanted to cover that. Okay. That? Okay, how it is set up, and this is pretty close to what you said, Roger, but the, the, the judges and the attorneys, they all belong to the American Bar Association, so there are a little bit of pals there. So the judge will not allow this to be brought up in court. Well, what about outside of court? I mean, there's what do you no mean? ethics violation if I, as an attorney, was not trying to tam do jury tampering for my own case or anything. Because um, I'm a member of the Florida Bar, I'm not a member of ABA or anything like that. Yeah. Association. I'm a member of the Florida Bar. So, is there, if I'm not jury tampering, is there an ethics issue for attorneys? Let me, uh, let me uh, well, I can tell you, uh, it's one of the, you know, it's funny, the, the suppression of our position owes itself to some close cases and split decisions by courts over the years, over the centuries, one of which was Sparvin Hansen versus, Sparf and Hansen versus the United States back in 1895. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, it, 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 let's just, I would say that the vast majority of the public agrees absolutely with Fiji. The only subsets of the population who disagree are guess who? Judges, all prosecutors probably. I, there, if I know, if, there might be a prosecutor somewhere who agrees with us, but they, by and large, don't like our position. And lawyers, I would say, are about split one third to two thirds against us. I'm just saying, all right? Uh, lawyers believe after going to law school for three years that they know the law and the common citizen doesn't know the law and that they, that, after going to three years and you look at a courtroom, after three years of law school, you look at the judge and the jury and you think the judge is above the jury. And it's not true. The jury is above the judge, at least with regard to the verdict. Okay. But after three years of law school, you and I both agree, hey, we think we know the law. We can't have common citizens who didn't go to law school. Uh, you know, second guessing our, our judgment after three years of law school. And so it is an issue. And, and well, you know as well as I do, if you mentioned what I've said, if I gave this talk in a court case, you better believe I'd be looking at, you know, issues. Now, I'm able to come here and give this, you know, this kind of, but you cannot mention this, this vast area of truth in a, in a court proceeding. Okay, well, Other than on appeal. On appeal, you can, you can write, and by the way, I have a great uh, amicus curiae brief on behalf of Fiji. Uh, oh, before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals right now. And uh, I literally went through and found all the case law. And again, the case law is on our side, generally speaking. There have been a lot of split decisions over the years. The case law is on our side. The Supreme Court has never, never uh, ruled that, that juries can only decide the facts and can never decide the law. The, the Supreme Court has never said that. There have been some close, it, it, it comes down to how they're instructed, basically. This is only about another minute's worth, but this gets kind of valuable, is all of us sometime, you may be doing something, walking downtown or whatever, 
where you're approached by an officer and, and he wants your identification or something. They do that right away just so they know who they're dealing with. Well, at least here in Florida, you don't have to give them your identification unless you're being arrested or cited. Yeah, I, I, right. So, so what it was is I was up in Apopka, a small town here, and I was handing out flyers about red light cameras. It had nothing to do with jury nullification. It's another crusade I was helping a friend of mine out. Uh, because what it is is we get with our libertarian type people, and this guy is is a red light cameras guy, and I'm the jury nullification guy, and some guy over here is doing something else. So we go out and help them, and then they help us. Okay. So um, a, judge, a cop comes up to me and says, uh, give me your identification. Next thing is, never carry identification. If you go downtown, you get out of your car, leave your wallet in the car. You can take your credit card and some money with you. Credit card is not identification. But if, if the cop just wants to give you some grief, the first thing he's going to want to do is probably give you a no trespassing order, which is no fine or anything. It just makes you leave the premises. But if you don't have identification, he can't give you a no trespassing order. You can just say you're King Kong. I'm, I'm, I'm Obama. You know, well, he doesn't know what's going on. So there. Uh, so that's one thing. Never carry ID. And the next thing is basically don't talk to him at all in a very professional manner. Because anything you say to him, they're going to use against you. Now, 95% of the cops are just fine. It's that 5% that keep coming after me. Okay, so uh, when I went to court to end this deal is uh, I got to the pretrial hearing, be, oh, excuse me, so the cop arrested me uh, for resisting arrest without violence, even though I wasn't being arrested, and that's a felony. Uh huh. So what he wanted to do was give me a citation for playing in the traffic and handing out the flyers. So when I went to court, I had a picture of myself handing out the flyers and also the, the, the um, fire department with the boot when they get money for multiple sclerosis. And the judge comes up to me and says, the judge says, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Schmitter, we're only here to talk about the felony. I said, well, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but according to Macon versus the State of Florida, 2003, Fifth District Court of Appeals, you gotta hear the misdemeanor first before you get to the resisting arrest without violence, because if, if I'm not guilty of this one, he shouldn't have been there in the first place. She didn't want to hear that trash at all. So, uh, so then uh, I sprung that on her and she goes, well, we'll let the jury figure this one out. So finally, uh, she is just bothering me all the time. You gotta get a lawyer, gotta get a lawyer, gotta get a lawyer. So uh, we could, I couldn't work it out with the state attorney for sure. So she says, now, Mr. Schmitter, I guess we're gonna go to trial. Aren't you gonna get a lawyer? I, I said, your honor, I'm gonna fess up. The reason I'm not gonna get a lawyer it's because I'm going to educate the jury about jury nullification, and only I can do that. And if I did have a lawyer, you would not allow him to talk about jury nullification to the jury. Which is absolutely true. Which is only I can do that, so therefore I have to defend myself. And I didn't even finish the sentence. The state attorney goes, I don't have time for this case dismissed. <laughs> okay, so what it comes down to is if you, only you can use that. And it's a trump card. Besides that, the other thing, Judge Melvin Perry put a no trespassing order on me for Orange County Courthouse for life. But then I had to go to court, you know. <laughs> not only that, they sent me a jury summons too one time. <laughs> I'm not making it up. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, here you go.